How can there only be one true God? If God is so good, why is there evil and suffering in the world? And doesn't the Bible contradict itself? Today on Gospel and Life, Tim Keller will continue exploring common questions people ask about Christianity. And as you experience more of Christ's love and grace in your life, we encourage you to consider becoming a Gospel and Life monthly partner, which helps us share Jesus' transforming love with more people around the world. To learn more about being a monthly partner, visit gospelandlife.com slash partner. Now, here's today's message. I think we ought to start off by being frank. We all would like the music to keep going, right? <laughs> but all good things come to an end, and so does a good program. I would like to talk to you tonight, and after, we're done, after I'm done with, with my explanation of the Christian faith, there's going to be a musical interlude, and then we have two, we have a mic here and a mic here. And uh, after that musical interlude, we're going to have, hopefully, about 15, 20 minutes in which if you have questions you'd like to ask me, come on down and use the mic. Now, obviously, if you get down here, I'll be able to hear you, but the reason for the mic is so that everybody else can hear the question. And uh, we'll have, so we'll have 15, 20 minutes at least in which you can come and, and uh, talk back to me. What I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to present this thesis. Miguel de Cervantes, Albert Camus, Aldous Huxley, Tolstoy, Voltaire, Shakespeare, Jesus Christ, they all have one thing in common. They all have one message in common. They know that the average person is so busy in uh, both work and play that you ratchet around for years and years without asking yourself, what is my reason for doing all this? What is my reason for life? What is the reason I'm doing anything and everything? What's my whole life about? Or, put it another way, when all is said and done, what will I have really accomplished? Why am I getting up in the morning? What's my reason for life? When I, I, what do they all have in common? They all, they all know, they're all great thinkers. And all the great thinkers realize that most of us run around and we're afraid to ask that question. What am I really getting to? What am I really accomplishing? What's my reason for doing things? Yeah, a good example of that is um, if uh, I saw one of you after the service and after the program here, and I said to you, uh, tomorrow at 2.30, meet me at the corner of 86th and Park Avenue. And you said, why? I said, just meet me there. Uh, you'd want to know the reason. And it, you're, busy pe- you're probably busy, very busy people. You're doing a lot of important things. And you would say, hey, if I'm going to spend my time, if I'm going to spend a, an hour getting to see you, seeing you, and getting back or more, there has to be a reason for it or I'm not going to do it. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. You want a reason. And yet, if I ask most of you, what is your reason for your whole life? <laughs> what is the reason you're doing your job? What is the reason that you're getting married? What is the reason you want to get married? What, what are you after? When your life is all over, what will you have really accomplished? Many, many of you will not be able to give an answer. You want to know the reason for me to meet you? You want to know a reason for that hour? You want justification for it, yet you can't justify your own life. Now, who am I talking to? I'm talking to people in general because that's the message of the great thinkers. Let me give you a quick example of this. Tolstoy. I've got a, I've got a series of quotes here. They're long quotes. You know why? Because it's Tolstoy. <laughs> All right? 1879, Tolstoy wrote his confessions, near, so, somewhat near the end of his life, and he talked about a huge collapse, crisis that he had in his life when he was about 50 years old. Uh, and he says this. He, said, uh, he had been actually living quite a life. He, he was very famous. He was very influential. He was really quite well off. And he'd been caught up in celebrity wealth activities and so on. And suddenly he crashed, just crashed. It wasn't a midlife crisis. You might have said it was depression. But uh, it, it wasn't because of the particular circumstances of his life. He crashed and got depressed because he had time to stand back and look at the general circumstances of human life. And he writes this. He says, the question brought me to the edge of the abyss when I was 50 years old. And the question is this. What will come of what I do today and tomorrow? What will come of my entire life? Or expressed differently, why should I live? 
Why should I wish for anything or do anything? Or, to put it another way, is there any meaning in my life that will not be destroyed by in my inevitably approaching death? And then he goes on. My deeds, whatever they may be, will be forgotten sooner or later, and I myself will be no more. Why then do anything? I therefore could not attach a rational meaning to a single act of my entire life. The only thing that amazed me was how I had failed to realize this from the very beginning. How can anyone fail to see this? That's what is amazing. I'm still quoting Tolstoy now, okay? <laughs> not me. I'm not trying to... Okay? How could anybody fail to see this? He says, I was 50 years old before I sat down and said, I can't attach any meaning to what I'm doing. I've never sat back and thought. What good is it going to do? Okay. Let me keep going. That's what is amazing. It's possible to live as long as life intoxicates us. But once we're sober, we cannot help seeing it's all a delusion. There's nothing funny or witty about it at all. It's only cruel and stupid. Ah, now somebody says, ah, Tolstoy, an artist, you know, gloomy. <laughs> Go ahead. You can call him names if you want, but you're not refuting his logic, I see. He says, if I'm going to die, and if this life is all there is, life means nothing. Because no matter what I do, it won't make any difference. I'll be forgotten. Now you say, Tolstoy, what do you mean he'll be forgotten? He will be forgotten. He won't be forgotten as fast as you and me. But he will be, and he realized that. And he says, it's not funny. You know, at the end of Cheers, the last episode of Cheers, the last 10 minutes is a place where they're all sitting around the bar, and Fraser says, he says, some people think that all life and exist is an accident, and therefore all existence and everything that we do is meaningless. And I think it's, somebody says, there's a cheerful thought, uh -huh, and everybody laughs, you know. Tolstoy says, it's not funny. He says, you're still intoxicated. You're still so busy, you don't want to ask the question, what is the reason for my life? What, am, what is my life about? Because, he says, the question will bring you to the abyss. That's Tolstoy. But frankly, I could go on with a lot of other quotes, and I won't, to show you that that's really the, the mark of the great thinkers. They say, stop ratcheting around. Stop being so busy. And stand back and say, what am I really living for now? There's a lot of answers to that possible question. And I would like to give you the main one that modern people, especially modern people in New York, have given to that question. What are you living for? Now, the main answer that modern people in a place like New York uh, give is, I'm living to be free. I'm living to follow my heart. I'm living to find what I want to do and do it with all my might. Now. That's, that's, there's not, that's not the only answer. There's plenty of other ways to, to answer. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take that for the next few moments and try to show you that that is an untenable position. And uh, I'd like to reason with you this way. Now, you know, I mean, this is a little complicated. I found that New Yorkers would rather get lost in, an art, in, a, in a discussion than have their in, intelligence insulted. I found that people out in the rest of the world are kind of the other way around. They'd rather follow you. Uh, New Yorkers would rather you, you know, say, go ahead, push me. Okay. The argument goes this way. You want freedom? The great thinkers, Camus, Sartre, other people like that, I'm going to give you a little list here. All people say, all the great thinkers will say, if you want absolute freedom to live your life the way you want, you have got to admit the utter meaninglessness of life. If you want complete freedom, you must face utter meaninglessness. That's the first point. Then my second point is going to be, nobody can live that way. Nobody can live that way. To really believe that, me that life is meaningless gets you into convolutions that are emotional, convolutions that are psychological, convolutions that are, that are logical, convolutions that are philosophical, and you can't even live that way. Because life does have meaning, and both freedom and meaning are found in Jesus Christ. That's the argument. Let me just let me push it. First, the average person says, ah, oh, yes, that, that's what I'm living for. I'm living to be free. I'm living to be free. I, 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 I can believe in God. I can't believe in God. I, I don't know what I believe in God, about God. But the one thing I believe in is that I have got to be free. I've got to be free to do what my heart calls me to do. Nobody can do that for me. Nobody can tell me how to live. Now, you know, um, the person who, the, the thinker, I think, who is the most uh, brilliant at analyzing the ramifications of this whole position, this whole idea, is Albert Camus. 
Uh, and a book I had to read when I was a freshman in, high, in college was The Myth of Sisyphus. You know, uh, recently we've had a spy scandal, the upper reaches of the CIA. Well, you know, in Greek mythology, there was a very, very ancient spy scandal. This has been a problem that's gone on for a long time. Uh, Sisyphus was found, was caught, uh, giving secrets, celestial secrets, to mortals. And so they caught him. The gods caught him, you see. So this is a problem that's been going on for a long time. And what they did to Sisyphus is something that I think the Justice Department should take notes on. What they did to Sisyphus was incredible. <laughs> they put him in a position where all day long he had to roll a rock up a huge hill. All day long he'd roll it and roll it and roll it. And just before he got to the top, 10 feet from the top, always, 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 every day, at the end of every day, the rock would full back, no matter what he did, and roll back to the, to the base of the hill, and the next day he had to turn around and start rolling it back up again and go on endlessly and endlessly and endlessly forever. Now, I think if the Justice Department is going to do that, <laughs> they need to uh, update a little bit. My suggestion is that you chain a person to a personal computer, that you make, the, make this spy, in this case, make the man, I guess, it's, I guess it's only the man, right? Not the man and the woman. But anyway, you make the man uh, do data entry, data input, all day. <laughs> and at 10 minutes before quitting time, every day, <laughs> the computer crashes. <laughs> and next day you have to do it again. Start with page one. But the point of the myth and the joke Hell is having to execute a pointless act from which nothing ever comes. Hell is having to execute a pointless act from which nothing ever comes except the need to do it again. <laughs> That's hell. And in the myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus is honest enough to say this. He says, we modern people believe in absolute freedom. Many of us don't believe in God at all. Many of us don't believe in a God that you can know. In other words, uh, modern people generally either believe in no God or they believe there's no God you can really know. And therefore, we believe in, in no God or no God you can really know because we believe in freedom. If there was a God, and if there was a God that we could know, who told us how we had to live, and who gave us the rules and the regulations, well, then we wouldn't be free. But because we believe in freedom and because we don't believe in the traditional views of God and so on, uh, because we don't believe in God, we're free. But if we're free, we're all like Sisyphus. And I, I remember very, very clearly the basic argument of the book. I remember I had to read it and we had to discuss it in freshman class and it was really quite stunning. But basically it went like this. Camus was saying, all right, think about it this way. Once you realize that you're free, because this life is all there is. There is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no, eternal, uh, there's no eternal being and so on. You have to realize then that nothing you do makes any difference. Let's just say you decide you're going to live a very compassionate life. Let's just say you're going to just, uh, this person over here is decides you're going to, they're going to live lives of violence and oppression. Don't you realize in the end when you die you rot? Ah yes, well, but your deeds live on. Yeah, for a little while. But don't you realize the three or four billion years in which organic life is going to live on this planet is just an eye blink, just a, just a you know, infinitesimal moment in relationship to the oceans of dead time that precede and that come after. In the end, the universe is going to burn up. In the end, nothing is going to make any difference. See, this is what Tolstoy realized. In the end, what you do and how you live makes not one whit of difference. To live a good life, to live a bad life, it doesn't matter. If the Titanic's going down and everybody aboard is about to die, does it really matter whether you go down hugging or mugging? <laughs> what difference does it make? What difference does it make to you or the person you're mugging? Who cares? <laughs> We're about to die in five minutes. Give me your wallet. What's the guy going to say? <laughs> he says, what a tragedy. This is, this is my entire life savings. No, what's he going to say? Here, have the wallet. Stab me while you're at it. <laughs> and Camus says, don't you know what that is? Don't you realize, okay, if it's true that whether you're hugging or mugging five minutes before you die, you see, if you're about to die in five minutes, hugging or mugging makes no difference. 
In other words, your life becomes meaningless. But don't you realize you're going you're to die in five minutes, so to speak, anyway. And so will the whole world, and so will the whole universe, and so will the whole civilization. We're all Sisyphus, says Camus. If you want freedom, total freedom, you have a meaningless life. Simple as that. Bertrand Russell put it this way. We're the product of causes that had no provision of the end they were achieving. That is, our origin, our growth, our hopes and fears, our loves, our beliefs are all but the outcome of the accidental collocation of atoms. All of our labors, all of our devotion, all the genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation be safely built. Yeah, what, what Sisyphus is saying, <laughs> what Camus is saying, what Bertrand Russell is saying, if you have absolute freedom, you must realize that everything you do is pointless. If you want absolute freedom, you have to understand that everything you do is utterly meaningless. Oh yes, Camus, Tolstoy, huh? gloomy artists, refute their logic. Try it. Put it in, let me just give you a more up-to-date person, Stephen Jay Gould, who teaches at Harvard. And he wrote an article just a couple years ago in Life Magazine on the meaning of life. He puts it this way. Now, well, I'll make a comment in a minute. He says, we are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. And we're here because comets struck the earth and wiped out dinosaurs, giving mammals a chance they would not otherwise have had available. And therefore, thank your lucky stars in a literal sense. Because the earth never froze entirely, we are here because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age. We are here because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed to survive by hook and especially by crook. We may yearn for higher answers. Good writing, isn't it? But none exists. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. This explanation, though superficially troubling, superficially, this explanation, though superficially troubling, if not terrifying, <laughs> is ultimately liberating and exhilarating. We cannot read the meaning of life passively as the facts of, in the facts of nature. We must construct the meaning of life ourselves from our own wisdom and ethical sense. There is no other way. See, just like Camus, it's liberating. The only way to be free, the only way to say, I can do whatever I want, I am my own master, is to admit everything is meaningless. The trouble is, and let me read one more before I move to the second point. So my first point is, you want freedom? You want to say, well, I don't know if there's a God or I don't know that there's a God I can know. I certainly, there's no God that I have to submit myself to and obey. The argument is, you have to admit that everything you do, every statement you make, every action you take, every choice is meaningless and insignificant. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould says this is superficially troubling, but liberating, which means I can do whatever the heck I want. But that's dishonest. Just as I make transition to the, to the next point, let me read you a much more honest statement look, dealing with the same data by the famous author Aldous Huxley. See, Stephen Jay Gould says it sounds terrifically noble, but now listen. Huxley says in his book, Ends and Means, he said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, I assumed that it had none and was able without much difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher, who finds no meaning in this world is not concerned exclusively with a problem of academics. The philosopher who finds no meaning in this world is also concerned to prove that there's no valid reason why he should not personally do as he wants to do, or why his friends should not seize political power and govern in the way that they find most advantageous to themselves. For myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. Don't you see what he's saying? At least he's being honest. We know what we're talking about here. He says, look, it, you come to urban America. You come to college here. You come to, you come to work here. And you say, finally, finally, I can really swing. I'm away from middle America. I can do what I want, you see. You want to be included. This is not a matter of, of just academics, like he says. He says, you look at the big issues. Is there a God? Is there meaning? Is the Bible true? Is there a revealed way in which I should, uh, should live? Should I be submitting? And you know, you go to Religion 101, you go to philosophy classes, you read books, and you think, as Huxley says, you're being objective, you're not. No. He says, I wanted to be liberated, therefore I had to adopt the philosophy of meaninglessness. And even Camus admits that. 
He says, if I'm, I, we can't believe in a God. We have to believe in meaninglessness. Otherwise, I wouldn't be free. But let me tell you something else that happens. You know, really what Huxley's saying is, I would rather choose hopelessness because I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. I'd rather be Sisyphus than Moses. Meaning, hope, freedom. We desire these foundational aspects of life, but how do we get them? In his book, Making Sense of God, Tim Keller compares the beliefs and claims of Christianity with the claims of the secular view by exploring which one makes more sense of a complex world and human experience. He shows how in an age of skepticism, the Christian faith provides the foundational needs we are searching for. We would love to send you a copy of Making Sense of God as a thank you for your gift to help share the gospel with more people. You can request your copy when you give at gospelandlife.com slash give. That's gospelandlife.com slash give. Because the gospel changes everything. Now, the first point, do you see it? Somebody says, you haven't proved a thing. You haven't proved a thing. I can tell. You're up there trying to make this Christian you know, religion palatable, and all you've done is made me feel worse about my position. Okay. <laughs> I feel worse. You know, you've, you've done a little bit of a number on me. I, I see that now everything is meaningless. All right, but so it is. So what? How do you know that that's just not the case? And I guess the answer would be this. There is no way that you can live on the basis of your worldview. Listen, how are scientific theories justified? How are they proven? It used to be, in, in days of past, they used to say, well, you prove scientific theories through investigation and observation. Observable phenomenon, that's the way. Well, that's not true. Nobody's ever observed an atom. Nobody's ever observed an electron, a quark. They haven't observed plenty of things that, that scientific, uh, uh, you know, science has, has essentially demonstrated uh, things to be the case. Theories that have been proven, justified. The way you justify a scientific theory is you say, does it account for the way things are? And without it, are we, do we find that there's no way to account for the way things are? Camus, Sartre, you know, the people I was just reading, they say, yes, well, Life is meaningless. I'm free. Life is meaningless. That's just the way it is. There is no way that you can believe what you believe without getting into a collision course with your own self, philosophically, psychologically, emotionally. Let me just show you what I mean. First of all, one of the problems that comes up immediately, Voltaire has an interesting statement about this. Voltaire says, you know, he says, meaning, the, the, the doctrine of meaninglessness doesn't quite work. He says, I am a puny part of a great whole, yes, but all sentient beings suffer like me, and yet, like me, they also die. However, what is the verdict of, the, and he says, what is the verdict of the vastest mind? He's talking about the universe's silence. The book of fate is, fate is close to us. Man is a stranger to his own research. He knows not whence he comes, nor whither he goes. Tormented atoms in a bed of mud. Boy, that's a great line. That's what you are. Tormented atoms in a bed of mud, devoured by death, a mockery of fate. But then he says, but you know, all, all things, all living things suffer like me and also die, but I'm the only one that's bothered by it. You know, he says, we're such a puny part of the universe and I'm the only one. Why do human beings get so bothered by the idea of meaninglessness? Why do we get so upset about it? You know, I look at my cat. She's a sentient being. She's a very puny part of the whole. Doesn't seem to bother her like it bothers me. We're supposed to be the most informed of the species. It bothers us. Why? Why is it that when I say life is meaningless, there's a part of you, the emotional part, that says, no. But if you want to be absolutely free, the intellectual part of you has to say, yes, I guess that's true. Don't you see already? Intellectually, you're on a collision course with what you know. Life can't be meaningless. There is purpose. Well, you say that you haven't proven it. Let me go a little further. One of the problems, one of the, pro one of the big problems of this whole thing is on the basis of the view you've got, you want to be free, you've got to believe everything is meaningless, and yet you can't live that way. Do you realize, for example, this means that nothing is absolutely wrong? If I say, you know, I say is rape always wrong? Well, yes, you say it's always wrong. What do you mean it's always wrong? Where do you get this idea of being wrong? Where do you get the whole idea of right and wrong? It's totally subjective. Maybe you can say it hurts, but how can you say it's wrong? Is violence always wrong? Well, I don't know. Is oppression always wrong? I don't know. You're, 
Yes, you do. But you see, you don't have a basis for saying so. Sartre had one little maxim. It is forbidden to forbid. It's a great maxim. I mean, at least, you know, when, when you're new in college, you get a hold of that one. And you say, <laughs> look at that. Life is meaningless. We're free. Authentic freedom, you see. Existentialism, right? Existence precedes essence. I can construct who I want to be. I live in absolute authentic freedom. The only thing that's forbidden is to forbid. Wait a minute. You said that you can't forbid anything. How can you forbid me to forbid? On what basis do you say that I should be forbidding? I shouldn't forbid you. When somebody comes up to and says, you know, all religions are relative, you know, all truth is relative. You can't say that your religion is right, so you must stop trying to convert people. And you know, what's the answer to that? Say, so you're trying to convert me. What do you mean? You're insisting that your view of truth, that all truth is relative, is right. And you don't want me to try to convert people. You think that's a, a very bad thing. Where do, you, where do you get the idea of bad? You say you shouldn't forbid anything except to forbid, but you can't forbid me to forbid. You've got no basis on which to go. You're on a collision course with yourself. There's a guy named G.K. Chesterton who years ago wrote about the real problem of the, the, the philosophy that, you know, everything is relative and all life is meaningless. He put it this way. He says, the new rebel in our time is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything, and therefore he has no loyalty and he can't even be a revolutionary. Now listen. The fact that he doubts everything, and he must doubt everything, bars his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine, and you can't believe in a moral doctrine if all things are meaningless. The modern revolutionary doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine of moral tr truth by which he denounces it. As a politician, he will cry out that war is a waste of life, yet as a philosopher, he has to admit that all life is a waste of time. A Russian philosopher denounces a policeman for killing a peasant, and then in his other writings proves that by the highest philosophical theory that the peasant should have killed himself. <laughs> a scientist goes to a political meeting where he complains that we are treating native peoples as beasts, and then he goes to a scientific meeting where he proves that we are beasts. <laughs> in short, the modern revolutionary, being an infinite skeptic, which he must be, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks persons for trampling on morality, but in his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on persons. Therefore, the modern rebel has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he has lost his right to rebel against anything. You know, in the same chapter, Chesterton says, there's a kind of thought that stops thought, and that is the only kind of thought that ought to be stopped. And the thought that we are absolutely free, that there is no God, that everything is meaningless, is the only thought that stops thought. You can't even begin to talk. As soon as you say, everything is meaningless, I have to ask you the question, is that a meaningful statement? Do you expect me to understand it? Are you trying to convince me of something? Are you trying to show me that it's true? C.S. Lewis puts it this way, if there's no answers, if there's no creator, if there's nothing that's really true, when you're in love, you must remember that only a psychopharmacological reaction in your brain is happening. There's no such thing as love. You may enjoy music, but you have to realize it's only a biological reaction. Beauty and ugliness, cruelty and compassion, totally subjective, not real, all in my brain synapses. And then he says, you may still, believing this, in the lowest sense, have a good time, but just insofar as it becomes a very good time just insofar as it ever threatens to push you out from cold and pure sensuality into real warmth and enthusiasm and joy, to that extent you will be forced to feel the hopeless disharmony between your own emotions and the universe in which you really live. See, the only way to enjoy flowers and love is to not think. You want to be free, and you have got to have a worldview that cannot account for how things are. Don't you see? If you start with a premise, I'm free and there's really no God or no God you can know. And on the basis of the premise, you have to conclude there's no such thing as evil when you know there is such a thing as evil. You have to conclude there's no such thing as love when you know there's such a thing as love. You have to conclude that human beings are no different than rocks when you know there's a difference between human beings. If you start with a premise and you come to false conclusions, why the heck won't you conclude that the premise was wrong? Why not think about the premise? 
Why not go back to it? That never happened to me before. <laughs> well, actually, it's never happened to me before in a white church, I must admit. But, <laughs> but, I've been a little concerned that all I've been doing is giving you male thinker quotes. So here's one. Dorothy Sayers said years ago, in this world, there is a view that's called total tolerance, but in hell it's called despair. It's the sin that believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, enjoys nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, but remains alive. Why? Because there's nothing for which it could die. Now, in the passage, now, no freedom, no total freedom without losing all your meaning. But there's a solution. The passage that was read by Bruce just before I came on says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, when the Gospel writer John wrote that, he, used, he was writing in Greek. And in the Greek, he used a word that was absolutely and totally loaded. He used the word logos from which we get our word logic, but that's not the right translation. The word logos was an absolutely philosophically loaded term at the time because it should be translated the reason for life. In the big, See, the Greeks argued over something. The word logos meant what is the reason for something. E example, if you see somebody trying to pop popcorn in an espresso maker, you go to them and you say, all right, let me explain to you why the popcorn is of such poor quality. <laughs> you don't know the purpose, the telos, the logos, these are all the Greek philosophical terms, you don't know what the design of that thing was. It wasn't built to make popcorn, it was built to make espresso. And you see, if you use something and you don't honor its logos, its reason for existence, its design, what the designer put into it, if you don't honor it, it can't reach its potential. Uh, let me go one step further. If you see somebody cooking weenies on a space heater in their apartment, you better say, don't do that. That's not what it was built for. And in this case, it'll be dangerous. You could burn down the place. Well, the Greeks said, you know what? If when you find the reason, the purpose for an object, it reaches its potential. And, it, and of course, we, and, and, uh, and, and we reach wholeness and potentiality. What if we found the reason for life? If we found out the reason why we were created, why we were designed, and we conformed to that and honored that, we'd be free. We'd, have, we'd, have all, we'd reach all of our potential. And the Greek philosophy groups went back and forth for a number of years trying to say, this is the reason for life, this is the reason for life. By the time of, the time of Jesus Christ, the Greek philosophical schools had gone, gone into utter despair. They couldn't agree. And basically, people started to say, there is no reason for life. There's no logos. And, of course, that began to sift down into the culture. Because, you see, when there's no reason for life, when everything is meaningless, the culture falls apart because you start to say, who's to say what's right and wrong? Why make a contribution? Why love my neighbor? And along comes John. And he drops this unbelievable bombshell, and he says, there is a logos. If there's a design, there's a designer. We know there's a design. And if there's a designer, the Logos has come. I can show you who the re what the reason for life is, but it's not an abstract philosophical principle. It's a person. The designer has punched a hole in the roof of the world, and he has descended. And you were built not just to honor some philosophical principle, but you were built to know and love this divine personage. And that when you know him, and when you serve him, and when you love him, and when you find out what he built you for, and when you comply with it, and you submit yourself to him, you find out who you are. You know, if you have a sailboat, you sail on the water, and you sail into the wind at the right angle, and you soar. And would, would you ever say, in the name of absolute freedom, I am going to sail my sailboat down Broadway? Well, otherwise, I'm not free. You would never dishonor the design of your sailboat to do that because by dishonoring its design, its logos, you destroy it. And that's what's happening to anybody who doesn't know and love the logos. Jesus Christ. What's your alternative to John's claim? 
The alternative is go manufacture your own logos. But what is it going to be? What, what is your purpose? What is your reason for life? Your beauty? You'll wrinkle. Hmm? Competition? Somebody will come along and do a better job. In the end, you'll end up staring into the fire. Because no matter what your chosen logos is, it'll never help you answer the questions we've been talking about tonight. It'll not help you face death. In the beginning was the reason for life. And he was with God. And that reason for life became a human being and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me pray to finish. Father, we ask that you'd help us to understand these things and apply them to our lives. And we ask that you would answer this request through the agency of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to Gospel and Life with Tim Keller. We pray you were challenged to explore common questions your friends and neighbors ask about the Christian faith and the transforming truth of the gospel that they can experience firsthand. You can be a part of changing hearts and lives all around the world when you become a Gospel and Life monthly partner. Visit gospelandlife.com partner to learn how you can help us share the true and life-changing message of the gospel. Thanks again for listening to Gospel and Life.